Hello. Welcome to Season 10 of The Horrific Podcast. We're two friends who live in different places but share a love for scary movies. In each episode, we both watch the same movie on our own and then record a conversation together about what we liked, what we hated, if we were scared, and maybe even some larger truths about why people watch horror movies in the first place. This season, our theme is Because We Have the Microphone. And because we have the microphone, you will listen as we discuss a bunch of movies that we just kind of feel like watching with no rhyme or reason. Think of it as a collection of movies that we've referenced a lot in previous seasons or been curious about for a long time. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the episode. This is one you've talked about for a long time as being a movie that you really like. Yeah. And I have always sort of like acknowledged that we would do it someday, so Mm -hmm. I didn't really look into it. Did not realize it was Wes Craven. Did not realize it was Ving Rhames. So, win-win. It was a win-win situation. In fact... Um, I think it was last night when Katie said, I can't believe that you watch people under stairs as a kid. And I was like, no. Yeah. You should. Yeah. But it was more of it, my teenage years. This was my, this is one of my dad's favorites. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it was like maybe like 16 and we were trying to find like a horror film to watch. And he's like, you know what one I used to like to watch? It's like, what? And he's like, people under stairs. I was like, oh. Never seen, you know, and then we we watched it together, and it was just like, oh my god, this is a game changer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, like I said, I had not seen it before. I wasn't really sure what to expect. And it, I kept reading that it was like horror comedy, but I didn't really see, it. to me, this was like the right amount of horror comedy. Mm-hmm. Like, it was definitely not comedy first and foremost. It was kind of more like dark humor, I guess, yeah. a little bit. But then, like, a, a, I thought a pretty decent horror movie alongside it. And it it kind of reminded me of, like, Home Alone meets Texas Chainsaw. Yeah, that 100%. Which I, I'm totally here for. Yeah, so. I was going to say, it It was like, it's like a R-rated child, mo- or, you know, children's movie in a way. So, yeah, Home Alone meets Texas Chainsaw Massacre is, like, the perfect Analogy. Yeah, and that, that's the thing I definitely want to come back to later is this idea of like it felt for a lot of the beginning of the movie and for a lot of the way it was sort of presented, it felt kind of like a 90s kids movie. But then there were some parts that were definitely not for children. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can see why you are the way you are. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> it makes sense. Also, I did see that Jordan Peele is currently working on a remake for this. Mm-hmm. And I finally saw a trailer for his new version of Candyman. So, oh, really? I have yeah, seen that. Yeah, so that's out now. It's definitely worth checking out, and I'm quite excited for both. That's awesome. But yeah, uh, I will introduce it, and then you can do your fun facts, and then we will get into the... I don't even know where to go. Fool, uh, foolish details. Foolish details. We'll go with that. I... Yeah, I was going to go way dirtier, but that's fine. <laughs> in 1991, Universal Pictures brought us The People Under the Stairs, a horror movie written and directed by Wes Craven. This movie tells the story of a young boy and two adult burglars, one played by Ving Rhames, I might add, who break into an old house owned by a rich family to see- steal a valuable coin collection. Once inside, they find a lot of danger and many dark secrets. This movie was made on a budget of $6 million and brought in over $31 million at the box office. It can currently be rented for streaming on Amazon Prime Video. To tie into that, it is $3.99 on iTunes, but on Amazon it's three sixty. <laughs> it's instead, it was like is that what we're doing now? We're just cutting off thirty-nine cents? That's how, you gotta stay competitive, man. <laughs> I, I mean, I went with Amazon because <laughs> obviously, yeah, they won. <laughs> just, I was like, what the heck? Crazy. But yeah, what did you learn about this movie? I learned that, um, so even though it doesn't necessarily say that Wes Craven actually based this on the story, or based the story of people under stairs on, uh, based off a real world incident. So in 1978, a pair of burglars forced their way into a home in LA um, I, police were called they showed up 
and they made a unrelated discovery. The couple living in the home had locked their two children in the basement of the home, um, which led them to which led him to craft the story. So people broke in, cops came, cops realized, oh, this is way worse than breaking and entering. At you're keeping your kids locked up in a basement, and so that's what Wes Craven based this uh, based this off of. Like just for funsies? Like, did the kids make them mad or what? Why did they have them locked in? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Probably, I just assume crazy. I figure that's what would have to happen. It also like plays into the mind of like Wes Craven. The fact like what you find out about the. Uh, the main antagonist man and whatever woman I think that's their technical roles Everett McGill and Wendy Robbie yeah it's just messed up stuff they do anyway last thing I got is even though you know we talked about Jordan Peele is bringing back people under stairs um, the movie was almost almost had a reboot before this Wes Craven intended to make a remake of the film in the early 2000s with a bigger budget he wanted to do this like what he did with The Last House on the Left when he had it remade in 2009. Um, unfortunately, the film didn't come together, um, but he pursued a series based off the show with the Sci-Fi Network. Sadly, Craven passed away in 2015 before any before work on the series could really get going. Um, but Jordan Pill is officially bringing it back, though, so that's exciting. Yeah, and to be fair, I kind of trust him more than anyone else that would have. Oh yeah, if he's now, yeah, so. if it's not Wes Craven that's doing it, then he's for sure like, I think the one that can bring this justice because you know this obviously is a you know um, social commentary on you know, yeah, and, and it's something that he will like be I would think be excited about doing and have like plenty of budget to work with. Mm -hmm. So it's not somebody just doing like a cash grab remake. Yeah, you know, that's it's true. somebody who's like excited about what creative things he can do with it and that's what gets me excited about most of the stuff that Jordan Peele works on now yeah yeah but those are my main facts for the film cool yeah so like I mentioned before I mostly like this movie but I had two things I wanted to point out in the beginning that I thought were like awkward or funny and yeah. then we can get back into me enjoying it but uh I like that the guy in the beginning is eating meat and then says, damn buckshot, and spits out a ball the size of a marble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like double up buck. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. uh, you could kill an elephant. With right. That, but anyway, that was just really funny to me yeah. and like over the top. Um, and then also when they sent Dexter or Fool, I had him as Dexter in my notes for a long time until I realized like Fool was his name. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't put together when he, that he was the one talking in the beginning. But anyway, yeah. he pretends to be a Boy Scout selling cookies and they don't do that. That's a good point, actually. I didn't, I never thought about that. Yeah. My, so. my biggest beef with this is, is just, um, how, Ruby Williams, the character Ruby Williams, full sister talks. It always sounded like she was talking in a whisper or like she had a voiceover or mm -hmm. something. And so it just, it didn't seem like it fit too much, but that's, you know, not anything that I'm willing to not watch this film over. Yeah. But anyway, all that said, this movie started off like super kind of just like nineties, kids adventure movie like it, it right. felt like it was going to be very similar to something like the goonies right yeah like it didn't really have a horror feeling to it at all and it was kind of like tongue-in-cheek funny and you had you know some people who were like very obviously the bad guys and then the people who were very obviously the guys you were supposed to be cheering for even though they were going to rob the bad guys but the bad guys deserved it and they're going to sneak into a house and then a dog chases them and you're like, Oh, oh. um, but man, it got dark after that. As soon as they get in the house, it's just like completely changed. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess a little bit before then, but that's when the really messed up stuff, I feel like kind of, yeah. kind of happens. Yeah. So like when basically from when fool meets Alice, um, it, like she's kind of telling him what's going on and 
you know, mommy and daddy were looking for the perfect boy child. Yeah. And they cut out the bad parts and put them in the cellar. Right. And so they had like Roach, who was the boy that got away, but had his tongue cut out. Mm -hmm. And that was the part where I was like, okay, we might be, we might be making a turn here. This might not be quite so, uh, so child friendly as I might have thought. Right. Which you'd have to kind of think it's like, oh, if, if, you know, if I'm recommending it, yeah, more than likely it has, yeah, it has to, um, it is funny though, cause like at the very be- you know, from the very beginning of the film and even like the very, very ending of the film, I feel like it's both, um, like child like movie yes. or, you know, yeah, uh, children's movie. Like it's just, um, and maybe, maybe it's because, you know, we see like the actor who plays full, like in, you know, the Sandlot and just, you know, Mighty Ducks, you know, we, movies that we've seen just over the years. Maybe that was the reason, but it was it. It definitely just had an overall feeling of it too. Um, yeah. And then also have like Bill Cobbs who played um, like Grandpa Booker, which I just really like. That guy, he's he's the one who's talking about the gold with them and stuff. And it's mm-hmm. just like all these kind of characters that you know, like Sean Whalen who plays Roach. You know, it's just we've seen them. In movies, just over over time, Ving Rhames, not necessarily in children's films, um, mm. but it's just like you just kind of think, like, man, I feel like I've seen this movie somewhere. Well, it's because they got a pretty cool, stellar cast, you know, like yeah. even the people who they got, like Everett and Wendy, who they played the man and woman, the characters, man and woman in this film, yeah, like they were like perfect creeps. Yeah. You know, like they just, it just fit, like the way they look. Yeah, you know, I mean, just, it was just like a, a great fit for that. And it was just, man. They almost reminded me a little bit of the neighbors from Christmas Vacation. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit, you know, like <laughs> yeah. just kind of that, that same vibe of like the people playing the role are absolutely perfect for it. And they're kind yeah. of like the, the, 90s couple from a different social class that is condescending. You know, it just, yeah. I thought, I made that connection early and then it was kind of funny until they got way more dangerous and which is <laughs> diverted from yeah. the stereotype a bit. But yeah. Which is funny you say that because Jeremy Roberts, who plays Spencer, the guy, the, the white guy who breaks into the house, he played a cop in Christmas Vacation. I did not know that. Yep. Small world. It is. Very small world. So I don't, I don't think I'm, suggesting that there is like a deliberate connection here or anything or like even a an influence but that scene well basically any relationship between alice and the dad reminded me a ton of the relationship between beverly and her dad in it oh yeah yeah where it's like it's almost like that like nothing really happens but you know there's like this subtext mm-hmm. that is super dark you because know because I mean? of the fear that she shows when yes, kind of exactly yeah. yeah and so um i thought that that was an interesting thing and i i felt like that could kind of fit into like a kids horror movie like the idea of being scared of one of your parents is like a super powerful yeah. terrifying thing but i felt like this one i don't know at least it, just from like her fear and her reaction to him implied you know, again, even beyond like what you would normally find in a kids movie or a horror comedy. Yeah. 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 I think it's, I think when it came to like, I I just, it's just so hard to explain how you could consider this like a kids R rated film because it's just (laughs) like so strange. I don't know if it's just like the way it was shot because it was the, you know, filmed in 90, you know, early nineties, the soundtrack, like it's just so strange, but it's like, you would have like, you know, like if it didn't have like the, you know, incestuous fa- couple, yeah, you know, with like dressing up in a uh, you know sex dominatrix like <laughs> outfit yeah. and stuff. Like if you didn't have that, it wouldn't and be putting nearly souls into dolls and cutting out tongues. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, but it's like I feel like you could even like, you know make that more children but just like the their relationship i think it's like okay well there's no chance that this could be yeah uh, well it's not like oh this is like a subtle thing for the adults that we're working into this kids movie it's just like no this is just straight up weird Um, and i guess i should also say to one of the 
facts was that, that I was reading about was so the characters who play um, mommy and daddy or man and woman in the film, um, Wendy and, and Everett, they actually played husband and wife on the TV series uh, uh, Twin Peaks. And so oh, that's that's okay. where Wes Craven saw them, and that's where he gotcha. pulled them from. So that makes sense, you know, but... Uh, I knew that that was true for her. I didn't realize he was as well. Yeah, so. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, and so you mentioned the dad, like, in the gimp suit. Mm-hmm. Was that not, like, such a template for the first season of American Horror Story? Uh, yeah, like, yeah. Like, the whole <laughs> visuals around that, it was just like, okay, yeah. well... That's not nearly as original as I thought it was. Like, there is a very clear line of influence here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, with that, I mean, it's it's funny to see the influences that will come from this. And and here's the thing, too. It's just crazy to think, like, this movie came out in 91, and this has been done a billion times, but it's just crazy to think, like, that you can create something that people are looking forward to the reboot of, you know, yeah. 30 mm-hmm. years later. You know, it's yeah. just... It's just crazy, crazy to think about. Yeah. Like how good, like, and here's the thing too, it's not like, I don't feel like people of the ser- people under the series is like one of the most popular horror films of all time. You know, I feel like it's like a, like a, a hidden gem in some cases. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't really ever see this movie on any like horror movie list or anything, you know? That's true, yeah. And it's just like, wait, like this is, yeah, it wasn't like this super scary or anything, but like, it's I wonder, horror, you know, I wonder if like enough people who were kids at the time that it came out got to watch it because it had kind of the trappings of a horror movie. Oh yeah, I'm sure that it just has made an impression on a lot of people when they were very impressionable. Yeah, and has stuck around. But I would say that as a grown ass man having seen this for the first time I also really enjoyed it yeah. so you know I think I think it has kind of yeah. a, a very wide appeal mm-hmm. and well, I mean like if if yeah. my dad is into it, who's not like he's not like a horror fan I mean he doesn't yeah. actively my my mom's more the one that was always in horror and and like if he's the one that was like hey I like this it's like oh like you know the guy who only watches Dallas Cowboys play football yeah i was going to say I, I didn't know, even know he'd watched a movie people <laughs> shooting guns on youtube youtube yeah. it's like this is one that he likes to watch and it's like oh, that's that's great yeah yeah and one thing that stood out about it to me that i i really liked that that is very like kind of the most memorable attribute of this movie for me is when I've talked about this a million times, but a thing that I really like is like the reversal of roles, like the, uh, where the hunted becomes the hunter and that part where fool goes back for Alice. Mm-hmm. And then he like makes friends with the people under the stairs. And then there's that scene where the mom is attacking Alice with the knife and the person just comes crashing through the stairs and bites her arm. And then they just start like erupting from the walls and cabinets and all over and stuff like, yeah, I've loved that. And the way that they just like swarmed her that was so cool because Mm -hmm. she was like the bad guy right like the the undefeatable antagonist for so much of the movie but then you still got that like feeling of revenge which is something that i feel like a lot of times you don't ever get in a horror movie and so the fact that they like turned the tide but they used sort of the supernatural creepy horror elements to do so is just like right in my sweet spot for what makes me like yeah. feel very satisfied at the end of a horror movie. And so um it wasn't necessarily like sort of that dark sad ending like we normally go for. Yeah. But it also wasn't like and everyone lived happily ever after. Like like there was still some real dark stuff going on here that yeah. you had to deal with afterwards. Right. And I think the thing, you know, as well is like after you know after they they the, all the people who live under the stairs escape like you gotta think too like the way they looked and everything it's like that might be wreaking havoc like on yeah, the city exactly. you know so yeah. it's like oh this isn't necessarily like a happily ever after exactly you know um situation but um yeah. now i one thing about the ending i did not like was the whole like confrontation between fool yeah. and the man I just thought it was dumb. Like the dialogue was cringy, and then it's like the big celebration scene afterwards. It just felt so forced and like a caricature of real human emotion or something. I don't know. I well, I yeah. did not care for that so much. I think the the thing is is like while so the the problem 
I guess my problem looking at it would be it, when he's when Fool is in the house, it is ridiculously like you see like how hard it is to get in. Like they have locks on the outside of their windows. Yeah. You know, they have all those um, metal doors to shut. Like it's all like, and so you know he eventually is able to escape. Um, you know, makes it makes it out, but. When he got back in, it was like ridiculously easy. And I know that he, that's cause he <laughs> yeah, knew the layout, true. but it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's like if, if with what they have in the house, it's like, how the hell did like he manage to do that? I guess was, was my thing, you know, and it was, it was, um, that was, I think part of what I think would be like a kid's show where that's like when, you know, Kevin McAllister decides that he's got to protect his house and, yeah. and he's going to, you know, set these micro cars on the floor. Like it was kind of like that thing where he's like, I'm micro going back. I'm saving going. my yeah, micro machine. Yeah. Uh, like I'm going to go back and I'm going to save. It was just like, that was way too easy. Like you, you yeah. did that way yeah. too easy. But, but I mean, at the end of the day, you know, one problem that we have run into with horror films is like, I feel like they, some movies they focus a lot on the meat in the middle, and then at the end it's just like, oh, we're running out of money. Let's just let's just end it, you know. Throw a dance number, we'll call it a day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or yeah. A, a scene of a crowd cheering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that was that was the real thing. But you know, also just considering how like off the wall this movie was, it was like, okay, no, that totally works. Like I I couldn't tell you how I would want something different, you know, or yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I thought uh, the pace on this one, that, that was a thing that we have historically complained a lot about with horror movies is they have these like super slow parts that where like all the momentum dies because they're either wasting time trying to like build an airtight story or they're trying to build suspense for so long that you kind of forget what you're supposed to feel suspenseful about. And this one I thought was just well paced. And the thing it did that I liked was the type of danger kind of changed. Like it, it built, right? So you start off in like, oh, he's, they're scared of the, the people that live in the house. And then you're kind of like scared of the dog that's going to attack. And then you find out that you've got like the, the parents are like the monsters that are more than just like scary adults. Like they're actually committing violence against people. And then you find out like there are all these monsters living in the house. And so just the way it kind of kept escalating and kept throwing in those new curves. Yeah. It was something that kept me very engaged with it. And so it felt like, like this was a very easy movie to watch. I was not like on my phone for a lot of this one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I also just really like the fact that like the man, like when you realize that Roach is in, in the walls, it was just like normal for him. Uh, he's just like, mm-hmm. gets the gun out and starts shooting the walls. It's like, what yeah. the hell is going on there? Well, and when he just like straight up set Roach on fire, like yeah. that was a dark and yeah. intense scene. I was not expecting that yeah. because it, it hadn't been all that intense up until that point and it was very graphic. Yeah. Let's the dog loose and you know, it gets, it gets, yeah, it was just, it was intense. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I enjoy this one. I appreciate you recommending it and bringing it up. And uh, I kind of regret that it took us so long to watch it. Yeah. I feel like it's a perfect Halloween Halloween film. Yeah. That's what I categorize horror movies by. And like this is because it's also one that that's when I watched it with my dad the first time, you know, and it's just like, I'll just watch it, you know, every October. I got to, you know, got to throw it in. And um, yeah, it's it's definitely definitely a good one. I highly recommend it. This is one I I generally recommend to people I I trust. Yeah, yeah, uh, a really good start to season ten. I know that this season, you know, we're excited about kind of going back and revisiting all those movies that we've like talked about a lot or referenced a lot while talking about other movies, but never actually done, or ones that we've been meaning to watch for a long time, or ones that are you know, maybe not strictly horror, but have elements that we feel like horror movies could learn from. This one, I think, basically meets all of the above. So it was great. Well, it's crazy you say that, or it's funny you say that, because, yeah, this I, I totally slipped my mind that this is season 10. Like, just the way that we're recorded? Wait, we're, you just said season 10. Yeah, but they don't know that we didn't know. Oh. They don't know that we just kept going. We, oh, yeah. Yeah, so they think we How about that stuff. break that we had? <laughs> I'm back and feeling so refreshed. 
It is it's nice to step May away for a while and right come now. back with fresh eyes. <laughs> Wait, no, wait. It is, it would be in the future. So this is October, uh, something. I don't know. I'm just going with it, but it is exciting. I'm excited about the season. Yeah. I'm very excited. Like I was just going through the movies last night with, with Katie when we were, I was seeing what the second film we're going to do is. Mm -hmm. I was like, God dang, we got some good, like I'm not just saying this, like I'm legit looking to all the movies that we have on the list, you know, got some bangers. Yeah, we do. We do. So. Yeah, and plus I'm not the fault if any of them are bad. So, it's a good season. Buckle up. <laughs> yeah. And that's it for today's episode. If you've listened this far, then thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed it. We're always looking for new ideas, so if you have any questions, comments, or movie suggestions, please send us an email at thehorrificpod at gmail.com, or feel free to comment on or message our Facebook page. Just search for The Horrific Podcast. Thanks for listening.